What I thought was interesting, Mark, is on an email exchange earlier, you said something about like how talking to your friends and family or whatever, they just don't get it or they don't seem to understand the... Oh, that, that was me, yes. actually. Yeah, oh, was it you? Yeah. That students when in intro but courses students, tend not and, to understand... No, 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 not just finish. intro courses, just people, you know, office co-workers and things like that. I used to, you know, over drinks, try and get into it. And it's, I think a lot of people, it doesn't even register that there is a problem. Do you want to tell us why there's a problem to start us off then? Okay. Throughout history, no. Uh, <laughs> I think the basic problem is that there's some beings for whom there's what it's like to be. So while a rock is non-sentient, sentient beings generally, you know, say a bat or a human being, there's a what it's like to be in the sense of having a subjective experience or a bodily sensation and so on and so forth. Now, the confusing thing is that human beings are composed of physical substances which themselves don't have that quality of being for, right? And generally, we expect that the properties of a, of a whole have some derivable relationship to the properties of the parts. But where atoms and chemicals aren't in themselves conscious, they somehow give rise to the whole which has consciousness. So I think that's one way of describing the problem. And there are a few other, I think, intuitive thought experiments, which we could, I don't know if we want to give those now or later. Well, it's interesting that, I mean, the problem has itself evolved, that the issue was originally not just what is it like to be something. That's the way Thomas Nagel, whose article we read, puts it. But it was more thinking in general, where Descartes, at least, is often described as thinking that everything mental is conscious. Whereas now, with the rise of Freud and psychology, we think a lot of what we might call thinking, information processing, right? How we recognize something to be what it is, is not conscious at all. This is something that is computational, maybe. So the whole notion of mind has been separated, to some extent, from the notion of consciousness. And I was really struck by this when I took a philosophy of mind class, how a lot of time it was like, well, what are the steps that we go through to understand a story or something? Can we program these into a computer and have the computer understand the story in some way? And it wasn't really touching on our conscious experience of what it's like to be something at all. So just the fact that there's been that shift, that now we think, oh, matter can contain information. It can do information processing. Right? Computers do that all the time. So that's not such a mystery. What remains the mystery is consciousness. Well, I think even calling it information, information can be a word that's equivocated, right? Because and then we get into the whole problem of semantics. But I think we should wait until we get to the Chinese room to do that. I, I feel like you guys might have already – it's already more complicated than I thought it was. <laughs> I wanted to step back to Descartes, though, because I think we should – say what his view was. But Seth, did you? I want to hear what, yeah, what Seth thinks the, the simple way of putting it is. <laughs> so, you know, we talk about there being a mind-body problem. So the question is, what's the problem? Well, the problem is your body is physical. It exists in space and time. It's subject to physical laws. You can be pushed around. You can be forcibly restrained and all that. But we think there's such a thing as we have a mind and the mind has ideas or something, you know, states as emotions, whatever. And those things, they might be in time, but they're not in space. So This is actually Descartes' formulation. This okay, there you go. And what's weird is you say, okay, well, ideas are not spatiotemporal. They're not physical. Right. Yet somehow we have this head that contains all this stuff, but it's kind of not containing it. And then the question is, well, how do those things that are not really spatiotemporal and not really physical actually make you lift your arm and grab a glass or mm -hmm. fall in love or something like that? It's this weird disconnect between these physical and this non-physical thing that we think can influence and control it. And it's giantly perplexing. It is a very difficult thing to understand. And if you say, well, we have a brain and the brain does the controlling, you've just inserted another level and you still have to figure out how the mind connects to the brain. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. It's a problem of going both ways. The, how does the mind affect the body and how does the body affect the mind? And for Descartes, yeah, it was. He gives two arguments for the whole idea that mind and matter are radically separate. One of them is sort of comes out of his clear and distinct ideas thing. So his premises are, I have a clear and distinct idea of the mind as a thinking, non-extended thing, so non-spatial. Um, cannot be cut into pieces. Yeah, well, that's another, that's actually oh, another okay. argument. So that's the second one. Um, so the first argument, the mind is non-extended, and that's its essence. The body's essence is to be extended. 
and so they must be different substances because things that have different essences must have different substances. So we, that's how we get what's called substance dualism, where there are two basic entities in the world. Yeah, and then the other argument is that the mind is indivisible. We experience ourselves as a whole, in a sense. The body is divisible, and those are their essences, and so they must be different. One thing I do want to say is that Descartes didn't say that everything mental is conscious. So, for instance, here's a quote. There's a, a lot of things arise, he says, from the intimate union of mind and body, like appetites, hunger, and so on, emotions, passions... So he's actually not as straightforward about what consciousness is as I think some of the caricatures of him have to be. Well, he believes that there's a lot of mechanism, like when you feel an emotion, I believe he, he said some impression puts itself on the pineal gland, the little part of the brain that he identified, which is not important. It's just a thing to, to snicker about, of how he thinks the mind and the brain connected. And if it's a particularly scary thing, then, well, the mind itself, the soul that is attached, this mental substance, is the thing that gets scared. However, at the same time, this perception somehow causes juices in the body to start flowing so that our heart gets faster and a lot of the physical things that we would attribute to emotion are actually just caused entirely mechanically. And once he introduces that, then he's able to say animals, he thinks, don't have a mind, don't have a spiritual substance that's connected in this way, but they do have a lot of the same mechanisms going on. So they could appear to be in pain, they could thrash around, they could sweat, they could do all these things, but it's pure mechanism. It, certainly it's not conscious. Well, let me, when, let me read to you from one of his letters, just because it's, you get more than the pineal gland. And I mean, the pineal gland, yeah, that's a glaring thing that people... Is it a letter to you? But he wrote me a letter. Uh, he actually, it's to the partially examined life, but he wrote it to me, emailed it to me specifically. No, but he said, but we also experience within ourselves certain other things which must not be referred either to the mind alone or to the body alone. These arise, as will be made clear in the appropriate place, from the close and intimate union of our mind with the body. This list includes, first, appetites like hunger. Secondly, the emotions or passions, and so on and so forth. That's kind of a side thing, but I... You know, I have always had the need to defend Descartes. But one of the other things is we should know what motivated Descartes' mind-body dualism, which is that he was reacting to a scholastic Aristotelian tradition in light of advances in modern science. So he wanted to get rid of final cause explanations from the description of physical phenomena. So, for instance, gravity is because there's a final cause tendency for things to go to the center of the Earth. He thought people were attributing mental qualities to physical phenomena in order to explain them. So he wants to separate those for scientific reasons, as well as arguably for religious reasons. So do you think that Ryle's characterization of Descartes is pretty good? Is on the money? It sounds like it is, in many ways. I don't think it's about Descartes. The chapter of the Gilbert Ryle book that we read, The Concept of Mind, he has a whole thesis in there, a behaviorist thesis that we're, we didn't read and we're not really going to go into. But the, the chapter we read, Descartes' Myth, a lot of it was just spent describing the Cartesian view, which again, I don't think necessarily has to be, it doesn't even matter if it's something that's exactly what Descartes says. Sure. That at the time that Ryle was writing, what he thought, the standard view that everybody believed, the establishment view, which is never as good as what Descartes himself actually said, or whoever, you know, Aristotle Well, it's just not that. Descartes specifically, it's dualism and what he thinks dualism in general is. We'll describe Ryle's position first, and then I'll give you my response to it. But I don't think uh, he's second on my list after Dennett of, <laughs> of intellectual enemies. What do you take his yeah. argument to be, Marco? He spent some time going over the, what he calls the official doctrine. And then what I found interesting was the position where he says that uh, he tries to explain, after he talks about how absurd it is, he goes into the origin of this. And it sounded like he was characterizing somebody like Descartes being conflicted between both wanting to say that there are mechanical rules for the body and so on, and that there is something similar going on in the mind. But the way I read it was because he said that Descartes had some other beliefs, perhaps the belief in, uh, in God and so on, and religious beliefs, mm -hmm. that he couldn't go that far. He couldn't actually say that everything that goes on in his mind was actually the same kind of thing that was going on in his body. And so according to Ryle, it seems like Descartes basically had to sort of take an escape route by just denying what he knew about, as a science man, what he knew about the body and the mechanical rules and just say basically, well, the mind is non-mechanical. While the body is in space, the mind isn't in space. And so he came up with this whole 
idea of the mind as just being something that's in some ways opposite to the body is defined by what it's opposite about it. But it also at the same time is uh, somehow in the same category. It's similar. It's the same kind of thing. It still has mm-hmm. laws. It still has this kind of it's organization, yep. but it's not, it's a different yeah. substance, right? And that's then the problem, of course, is how do these two interact with one another? Yeah, I think that's right. In the way he talks about it, right? He thinks that the dualists went wrong when they were looking for a functional description and they ended up with a causal hypothesis, an illegitimate causal hypothesis. So if you're looking to talk about mental conduct predicates, you can do that according to Ryle in terms of dispositions. You don't need this occult cause. And Descartes went wrong because where he should have been looking for a criterion to distinguish intelligent from non-intelligent behavior, he got mixed up and looked to get at this cause, and that cause had to be reified like a physical object, and yet it was invisible and ghostly and so on and so forth. That's right. And he calls that uh, category mistake. Right. Right. And in Descartes' defense, you know, it sure seems like I cause my own will... I want to think of an elephant, bam, there's a picture of an elephant in my head. Like, it seems like we witness causality in our heads all the time, but it's obviously different than the causality that we see in the external world. So we've talked about that in terms of Kant's analysis and stuff. So it does seem like there are causal laws for both of these areas. But I picked this because I felt like he was representative of one of the major strains of people writing about philosophy of mind, where they see this fundamental problem that whether Descartes caused it or not, Who knows? But, I mean, that arose out of this view of Descartes, and they just find it intolerable. They find that if you're going to posit a substance, a spiritual substance, to be the mind, when really we don't know what's going on. I mean, again, just going a little farther in the way Kant would look at it, well, we've got these mental appearances. We have no idea what's going on behind it. So to posit an actual mental substance, right, Kant doesn't want to do that. He's going to be a skeptic about this. So, But Ryle is arguing not just against substance dualism, Well, that's what he talks about, and I don't think people have thought through these other kinds of dualism that are maybe more reasonable. Um, And this is, I think, maybe where our big disagreement sort of before reading this came in, is that I feel like the enemy of just about everybody that we read for this time is substance dualism. It's not all kinds of dualism. Not everybody like Ryle thinks we have to get rid of mental talk altogether or deny that we are conscious beings or something like that. It's just this idea that Descartes put forward of two separate kinds of substances that then we have this hard issue of how they interact, that's just intolerable. Maybe if if we can't push forward on this and we do things like, oh, you know, we weigh a body after it dies, does it weigh any less? Oh, then the soul, you know, must not weigh anything. (laughs) You know, people were taking the soul, spiritual substance, seriously for a long time before we reached this point where people like Ryle got fed up and said, is there a different way we can think of this? And this whole talk of a category mistake that, oh, no, the mind is not a substance. When we use mental terms, we must be talking about something else. And as far as what we read, he doesn't actually go any farther than that. Now, you're right, Wes, that the view that he eventually takes is is a behaviorist, that what a mental state is, is a disposition, right? If you desire something, that's really, it's a disposition that you will get it if you want it. Of course, I use the word want. Or if you say someone is vain, for instance, you're giving a series of hypotheticals. You're saying, well, if this happens, they're going to do this. They're going to boast under these conditions, blah, blah, blah. But I think Ryle's the one committing the category mistake here. Should I tell you why, or should, do we want to characterize his position more first? Or? Let me say two things. So his eventual position on this is this dispositional account of desires and wants. And historically, that has not done well, because it's really hard to say what the disposition exactly is without using other mental language, right? So if I want to say, what's the dispositional mm-hmm. account of a desire? Right. Well, it's you go and get things, right? I'm trying to give you just observable behavior. Right. But it's not you always go and get things. You go and get things if you think that it is there to be gotten. Oh, I use the word think. No, no, no. I have to get... Right. Okay, well, how do we define think in dispositional terms? Like, then I, if I think it's there, then I'll go and get there. But only if I want it. So... Yeah, and this is where we we, we get to more contemporary versions of functionalism, they don't try and reduce everything to behavior. They want to say that you have to also be able to talk about other causes that are mental. So, right. Just the definition, since you brought it up, of functionalism is to say how we define a mental state is that it functions in a certain way in relation to other mental states or behaviors or causes yeah. or whatever. Mm-hmm. So if, if you want to say, what's the definition of a desire? Well, it's a desire that interacts with beliefs in the way we were just talking about, to produce certain actions. You could sort of lay things out like a flowchart. 
Mm-hmm. Right, which is why computer scientists really like functionalism. 